Hi students, welcome to Year 12 Biology in Module 7, Infectious Disease. This is video number four, and this time we're going to be looking at modes of transmission. So this ridiculously long learning uh, outcome that we're trying to focus on is basically this time about investigating modes of transmission of infectious disease, specifically including direct contact, indirect contact, and vector transmission. So what we'd like you to focus on is firstly defining the term transmission as it applies to pathogens and infectious disease to be able to describe the following modes of transmission, direct contact, indirect contact and vector transmission, and to be able to contrast and perhaps even evaluate various modes of transmission of pathogens using named examples. So let's get into it. So as you've already seen uh, from what we've already looked at, there are a number of ways in which pathogens can be transmitted from one host to another. The first way is through direct contact. And direct contact is hands, skin, lips, mucous membranes, any um, when two hosts are in contact with one another, and that can be as simple as shaking hands um, or having a hug. That sort of thing can still result in the transmission of a pathogen from one host to another. There can be direct contact of body fluids. Um, uh, hepatitis, for example, is one very uh, important disease that was actually transmitted through blood in, uh, transfusions. And AIDS, too, is uh, uh, transmitted in that way. Well, the, the HIV virus is uh, transmitted through direct contact of body fluids. Then there is indirect contact. So indirect contact is basically uh, someone who is infectious touching an object and then somebody who's non-infectious actually touches the same object and contracts that particular disease or at least picks up that pathogen. Now this can happen in a number of different places. So it can happen in the air and that's where tuberculosis was a real problem. Uh, because it was able to be transmitted through air. So you didn't have to have person-to-person -person contact. You could just be breathing the same air, and that was a problem. Um, you may have, I'm sure, at some point had a tetanus shot, and tetanus is one of those ones we get when we've kind of um, maybe cut ourselves on some rusty wire or something like that. Uh, hookworm is something that can be transmitted through soil. Salmonella, uh, not a particularly nice uh, bacterium, and that can be transmitted through food, particularly um, uh, poultry. And also cholera. And cholera, when we look at uh, cholera a little bit later on, uh, track back to water supplies and people sharing the same water supply, the same well, and uh, transmitting the uh, pathogen on uh, in that way. And the final way that we need to look at is through a vector. And we'll have a little bit of a look in this video at uh, the life cycle of the plasmodium that causes the disease malaria. And you'll see that there's a very important vector that's involved. It's actually an insect, uh, the mosquito, that's involved in the life cycle of that. So vectors is basically transmission from another organism. So from host to host via an intermediate organism uh, or by other animals. So you can see this little graphic uh, gives you a nice uh, idea of some of these general kind of types of transmission and specific human to human transmission. So all of the ones that we've already talked about, direct contact, indirect contact, droplet um, sharing, uh, airborne ones, and sometimes fecal oral, and, and then also through abiotic factors, so wind and water and animal vectors. So there's a range of different ways in which pathogens can move from one host to another. Some of what we need to do when we're looking at pathogens and infectious diseases, get some idea of the life cycle of the pathogen, and that will give us some idea about how long it needs to be in a host before it's looking for a new host, the, whether or not it does need something like a vector to pass on, whether it's able to survive outside of the body of a host for some period of time, and what conditions uh, are required for it to be able to survive outside of the body of the host. That brings us to food handling. And we briefly looked at this in our little overview of um, microbes in food and water. And obviously microbes in food is a big problem. And it's a big problem that happens uh, both for 
us when we're cooking in our own kitchens as well as uh, in domestic and industrial uh, situations. So even something as you, uh, as simple as separating your chopping boards for vegetables and meat so that you're not um, chopping raw meat on the same uh, chopping board that you would also use for vegetables. That sort of thing is a, a nice simple way. A lot of people use a color code system, different colored chopping boards for different types of things, uh, meat, uh, red meat, white meat, uh, and fruit and, ve uh, fruit and vegetables and those sorts of things. Um, the handling of raw vegetables and raw meats is very important and also the way that those are potentially cooked and washed before they're being prepared. I talked in the last video about the importance of um, thawing uh, or dealing with frozen food and also reheating food um, and bay marie's are very common particularly for buffets and of course these can the, the temperature at which these uh, foods are kept can either um, keep the microbes from uh, reproducing altogether or actually create an ideal environment for them to reproduce at their maximum so you can see here a nice little uh, diagram taken from the Nelson book, um, which is um, Biology in Focus. You can see here a nice little scale and a very important danger zone, which is the area where microbes are most likely to be reproducing above that zone. The temperature is too hot and usually most of the time they will be killed. Um, below that, they may not be killed, but they may be inactive because they're just um, reproduction rates are so slow that you really are slowing them down. And obviously, that's one of the points of refrigeration and freezing. But within that range, um, which could be room temperature, leaving food to thaw um, just on the bench and forgetting how long it's been there, um, and also in the reheating of food. These are very important ways that we can help prevent um, the spread of these pathogens. And just quickly, and we'll have a look at uh, a number of different case studies because this particular topic lends itself very well to case studies. And I think one of the things that's important for you to keep in mind is that as we look at examples of each of these different types of diseases, it's it's critical for you to kind of have something in your head. An example, maybe it's a disease that you've had yourself at some point in your life. Uh, maybe it's it's one that someone that you know very well or um, that you've either helped nurse or seen firsthand, what they've gone through, how they contracted the disease, uh, what symptoms they were displaying while they had the disease, what treatments uh, they were undergoing while they had the disease. Uh, and that just helps when you're uh, under pressure and writing about this sort of uh, thing for you to be able to recall those important key, key points. But in addition to that, there may be some uh, examples or some case studies that are worth looking at. Malaria is one of these. And one of the important things about the life cycle of uh, malaria, or at least the plasmodium, which is a protozoan uh, pathogen, uh, is that it has it uses a vector and so the mosquito is the vector so you can see when we look through this life cycle we can actually see that in order for this uh, particular pathogen to get from one host to another it does that through via the vector so the mosquito is the vector in this case what it's doing is it's transmitting the plasmodium from one human to another so in the process of um, uh, injecting its anticoagulant to allow the blood to flow while it's feeding. Um, it will inject some of its own fluid into the body. Uh, if it picks up a plasmodium, what it can then do is when it injects the next um, person that it's feeding from, it can inject the, pas the plasmodium into their bloodstream. And this is how the plasmodium can get from one individual to another. You can see there's a quite complex life cycle here and it's not critical for you to um, know this particular example. It's probably useful for you to have an example that you can talk about. And so maybe you might want to choose this one as a good example of a uh, disease that in involves the use or transmission via a vector. Um, and if so, then I would look at this in a little bit more detail. Um, there's also another reason to talk about malaria that we'll look at later on, and that's its relationship with sickle cell anemia. And, and a particular example where um, there 
the incidence of sickle cell anemia is a little higher amongst populations that are have a high incidence of malaria and it does seem to be some slight advantage if you have a, a carrier for sickle cell anemia where the, the red blood cells become sickle shaped, they're kind of a little bit squashed, which reduces their ability to carry oxygen, but it also reduces the um, likelihood of the plasmodium making its home there. So an interesting little contrast. So malaria is an interesting disease and it's one that we're going to look at in a little bit uh, of detail later on, but one you can think about as an example for a disease which is transmitted via a vector. Thanks for watching.